Hello everyone. In this presentation, we are profiling the work of Maria Martinez Cañas as part of our series on contemporary Cuban artists, coordinated by curator and author Andrea O'Reilly Herrera, who has written extensively on the Cuban diaspora and whose published works also include poetry, fiction, and theater. Her most recent work is titled Cuban Artists Across the Diaspora, Setting the Tent Against the House. Please welcome Andrea O'Reilly Herrera and artist Maria Martinez Cañas. So welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to, to welcome everybody to the Contemporary Cuban Artists Series, which is sponsored by the Cuban Cultural Center of New York. Um, thank you so much for being with us. This is a really very special occasion for me, especially. Um, I also want to thank Iraida Ituralde for your constant support and for to all the members of, of the center. So today, this afternoon, we have the honor and the pleasure of having Maria Martinez Cañas. And we go back a very long time, um, more than 30 years, Maria. I was, I was just um, thinking about it this morning. And so I would like to um, tell everybody a little bit about Maria, and then I'm going to be turning it over to Maria so she can, she's going to show us through visual images, um, give us a sense of, of, of her career and the evolution of her work. And then we're, we save some time so that we can have some conversation together. So, Maria Martinez Cañas was born in Havana, Cuba. She left Cuba as an infant. Her family first landed in Key West, um, but in 1964 relocated to Puerto Rico. And the family stayed in Puerto Rico until 1978 um, when they returned to the United States. And Maria continues to reside and work in Miami. Maria received a BFA in photography from the Philadelphia College of Art and an MFA in photography from the, from the Art Institute of Chicago. An artist who works with innovative, non-traditional photographic media, she has exhibited extensively in the United States and abroad with a 51 person exhibitions and over 300 group exhibitions. You have been very busy, Maria, it's amazing. Um, Maria is the recipient of the Ulay Arts 2020 Michael Richards Award, a Pollock Krasner Foundation 2016 Photography Fellowship, a Civitella Ranieri Foundation 2014 Visual Arts Fellowship, a Seamthus Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Award, and a Fulbright Hayes Grant that took her to Spain. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Her works are included in many permanent collections, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Pompidou in Paris, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Those are just a few of the places. Maria's work is represented by the Frederick Snitzer Gallery in Miami. She's an associate professor, tenured, and the head of the photography department at New World School of the Arts in Miami. So I would like to welcome Maria. Thank you so much for taking this time with me. I'm, I'm very excited about this conversation. And I'd like to just turn it over to you. I know you have a PowerPoint you'd like to share with us. So it's yours. Well, thank you, Andrea. And thank you um, to Iraida also and to Cuban Cultural Center in New York for um, having me uh, doing this. And for all of you that are here that are going to listen um, to my talk, I appreciate that um, immensely. Um, as as Andrea told you, I have a, I'm going to just share really quickly my screen and we're going to, let's go to a portion, share, and you can see my, my first, the cover page, no? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, one thing that I just wanted to, to um, 
to say because when Andrea, you mentioned that um, my family came back to the United States in 1978. I was the one who came to the States to, to go to the university, uh, but my mother remained in Puerto Rico the same as my dad. Um, so um, they eventually, little by little, we all ended up in, the, in, the, um, in Miami, in the United States. Um, you know, in many ways, um, you know, going from one place to the other is something that is very, in many ways has become the norm for Cuban exiles and for uh, those of us that did not have the opportunity to grow up in the country that we were born. So um, that sense of moving is something that I'm gonna be talking um, about uh, today. So um, I just wanna say that I, I belong to a generation of artists who have experienced the consequences of upheaval and displacement in my own life. In many ways, uh, the work you will see this afternoon belongs to a fragmentary journey, one that was given to me by my parents. I have tried with my work to chart my origins, to trace my identity and to position myself in a way that makes sense to me as I define through the years who, who I am. Um, my work has become a visual history of migration and displacement within uh, my own life. Now, I call the, the talk Basic Codes of Origin because in many ways it's about the beginning. It's about that thing that makes me um, who I am. Um, so um, and let's you know, make sure that I'm here. Okay, so sometimes when I give in most of my lectures, I start with a uh, quote from Edward Said from his book, uh, the P Palestinian writer Edward Said um, from his book, Reflections on Exile from 1984, that says as following, Ex exile is a strangely compelling to think about, but terrible to experience. It is the unhealable rift force between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be surmounted. And while it is true that literature and history contain heroic, romantic, glorious, even triumphant episodes in an exile's life, these are no more than efforts meant to overcome the crippling sorrow of separation. The achievements of exile are permanently undermined by the loss of something left behind forever. Um, you know, I have no doubts, and what you're looking at is not something that I show all the time, but I like to, um, for people to realize that I have my first exhibition on November 10th of 1977. This is the uh, cover for that exhibition at the Galleria PL 900, which stands for Ponce Leon 900. It is also known as Casa Aboy and it was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. It was the summer before I became a senior in high school. Now, I have no doubts that my parents need to be connected to their past was instrumental in my understanding of the power of the photographic image. As a child, they would spend hours showing my sisters and I images of a lost homeland, of lost family members, searching for a connection to a place I did not know, but that shaped my family and who I was. Um, it's been a revelation to consider the silences that have been present in my personal history. I see now that my career path began not just with the historical images in my book about photography, but also in the pages of my family scrapbooks, and perhaps most importantly, in the missing pieces of my parents' past. They gave me a visual memory of a place I did not know, and this gave me an identity, a fragmentary identity. And I called it that way because in reality, it was their memories that they were given to me because I have no visual memory of Cuba um, at all. I'm gonna also show you some um, two, inf two, three influence influences on my work. Um, and one of them, the first one is Harry Callahan, the American photographer, Harry Callahan. My early works um, were informed by the poetic black and white compositions of the American photographer, Harry Callahan. And in particular, this work, um, which is titled Grasses in the Snow, Detroit from 1943. Callahan, I saw this image, by the way, in person when I was 15 years old, when we were on our way 
from Puerto Rico to New York, New York to Paris. And it was in New York at the Museum of Modern Art that in one of the photography galleries, this piece was um, on exhibit. Um, it gave me the understanding that photography could be more than just documenting the exterior world. And that was something that was really important to me. Callahan's subtle yet powerful works taught me that photography could be more than a mirror document and it could transcend the specific of place and time such that identity could be totally lost. I thought I was looking at, at a sheet of music. Um, as I am interested in the metaphoric potential of photography, my work of this time evolved in a signature working process that allowed me to fuse aspects of painting and photography, abstraction and representation, as well as explore the complexity associated with identity and exile. And this is one of my early works. I was 21 years old on my starting my third year of my junior of my bachelor's degree in Philadelphia. The fragmentary appearance of the photographic imagery with my photographic work has led some people to suggest that photography for me plays a secondary role, role. And this conclusion, while perhaps warranted in a purely visual sense, ignored the extent to which photographic information plays a defining syntactical role in my work. The creation of an image for me has two co-equal components. First, the recording and gathering of visual details that interest me because of their cultural codes, from architecture to landscape to pre-Columbian sculpture, and then the rearrangement, the arrangement and restructuring of these details into the larger coherent frameworks of my photo montage. This piece in particular is of importance to me because it represents the beginning of my identity as an artist, what will become my style. And in many ways, it was the answer to an still life assignment that I did not like the assignment. I didn't like the idea that I needed to do a still life, but I thought, how can I make this assignment work for me? So what I did is I will photograph a still life printed it or exposed the negative onto the photographic paper. And after I did that, normally we will take the paper to the, to the developer, but I decided to remove the negative, throw white light to it and technically make and turn that image dark. But I cover certain areas of the areas of the paper that allow me to then leave the still life to be shown after the image is developed. And this is how this um, came about. Um, and that's why I consider this work in particular, the beginning of that visual voice of me as an artist. Another influence was Arno Raphael Minkinen, a Finnish American photographer noticed for his unmanipulated new photo portraits, self-portraits in the landscape. He was a teacher in my senior year in Philadelphia and a mentor a major influence in the work produced during this time, which are nudes. Because a lot of people think that because I work experimentally, I do not make traditional photography. And if that's not true, it's because I, I take, I, at the end, I, I experiment with the medium. Or when I photograph, I, I photograph very traditional. And it is when Arno was my teacher that I decided to do something I never done. I photographed my classmates in the nudes. This is Celeste. Um, one of my classmates. And this was a time for different for a different experimentation. I was working in, in the abstraction images, but I also was doing this kind of work at the same time. This is also Jeff. He was my boss. <laughs> and then I will photograph another classmate with um, which is uh, Jeff. And then in my last semester of my senior year, I started doing and working with maps. And that just happened by reading um, a, an essay by the late photographer and educator, Gary Metz. In his essay, and this is titled Photography and Representation, or There's More to the Spectacle That Meets the Eye, he writes that the map is not the territory that we represent that our experience, our perception of the world is not the world. He also says that any perception of the world will tell us more 
about our perception that it will tell us about the world. And this essay would play a defining part in my development of understanding the photographic image. A map, for instance, is not only the representation of a territory. And it is me working with collaging, creating, working with map for the first time in my career, just working with maps, sometimes with my photo journal, which is what you're seeing on the right, on the work on the right, but my handwriting, the, the way that I relate to Indian, um, to Indian, to pre-Columbian art, to um, for family photographs, all of that is when I started doing in my last semester of my uh, bachelor's degree. To me, it is a visual source for a unique language and at the same time, a painful tool for understanding where I come from and who I am. Many times I have described myself as a Cuban born, Puerto Rican grown American citizen. And these three aspects of my identity have significantly defined the way that I feel, the way that I think, and the way that I approach my perception of the world in which I live. And then a major influence on my work, um, my teacher and also mentor, Barbara Crane. Uh, she was my teacher. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, because she was a faculty member there. Uh, together with other two other faculty, Joyce Neyman, the photographer Joyce Neymanas, and the art history um, and a curator of Latin American art, Bob Lesher. They were the three defining faculty members that I got to know their work and that made me apply to the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, it, Barbara was a defining influence in my career as an artist, taught me how to look at a photographic image differently. And she also pushed and also helped me to push the boundaries of the photographic images. And these little works are part of my graduate work at the Art Institute. Memories itself, a kind of montage, a fragmentary selective quilt of impressions and experiences from which we fashion a history of ourselves. And what is really interesting is that now the notes that I did with Arno, you will see them inside the fragments of the, of the aspect of the thing. Very interesting that a lot, one day I did a presentation of the influence or the Euro, the utilizing the body of part of the fragments of my photographic things. And it never, I never realized that until I gave that lecture and I put together a PowerPoint presentation, how much I was influenced with that or that aspect of my work of using the body and using gender. That's something that is also very important on my work. Now, what Photomontage does is assemble diverse images into a larger integral whole that has its own identity as an image. One of the things that you're gonna see in a photo montage, in case some of you do not know what I mean by that, it's not a collage. A collage is when you place something on top of something and you can touch those layers. A photo montage is when you do the layering, but you do it as part of the negative. And then when you print it, this entire thing becomes a single one, one plane, you, you touch it, there's nothing on top of it. It's been done um, in the dark room. Um, now, memory does much the same, creating an integral sense of identity out of fragments of the past. We layer and layer information into who we are. Now, as Andrea mentioned, um, I did get a Fulbright, and this is the work that I started under the Fulbright grant. And as I reflect on my work as an artist for the past, over 40 years, I realized that creating and developing a unique, unique ways of working with the photographic medium have remained constant. I have often felt like an alchemist trying to create something completely unknown from the combination of light and chemicals, two components that are intrinsic to the photographic image. Maybe today chemicals are not as important anymore. For some of us, they still are. But what has never changed is that we still need light in order to create a photographic image, no matter if you use a word that I hate, analog, I like film better. If we use film or we use digital, that part of light, it's, light is a main component. It's an intrinsic component to the photograph, to photography. Now, photography and identity were the two most important components in my early development as an artist. I have never accepted the idea that the camera function is only to record. 
Um, during the year of 1986, I live in Spain under a Fulbright Hayes grant, collecting and researching visual material for the development of my work. I felt the need to utilize the old maps and letters belonging to Cuba's discovery by Christopher Columbus. Um, and to be exposed to the form and content of these objects, of the maps. The idea of utilizing maps literally as objects to locate turned into a personal interpretation of these objects as a way to find myself. Um, and I wanna, what something that I did and I for this uh, presentation is I also included two images of details of negative so you can see the material because the negative for this work, if this piece is 40 inches uh, tall by 60 inches long, the negative for this work is exactly 40 by 60 also. A lot of people don't know that because they never see the negatives. But in reality, the template of the negative is what takes me the longest to create. And here you have, um, and I'm gonna really quickly just go back to the early. I, I'm gonna, you're gonna see an image of this area right here. And I hope that you can see my cursor. And then you're also gonna see an, a, another image of this area right here of the right-hand side, okay? The first one is the one on the left. You, this is a positive, but this is the detail of that template that was done by, by hand. Cutting, the material that I use is called amberleth. It comes completely covered with this material that has a color, either red, or amber, depending on the color, it's called rubylith or amberlith. By using an exacto knife, I make all the shapes and then I strip it. If I remove the material, light is gonna go right through it and make the print dark or black. If I add conventional black and white photographic negative, an imprint of that negative will be where that negative is, okay? So if I, make little holes on the orange material, the red material, they will come like little marks, okay? Now they also make, a friend of mine who was an architect found the same plastic material that comes in liquid. So sometimes I might fingerprint that material in there. So I not only have white and pure black, but now I also may have texture or middle gray. So I, one of those can take me from two weeks to five months just to make one of them. But I want you to realize that everything that you see here, starting from, let's say, this image, have used that way of working, okay? Um, and it defined the way that I work for the, for the first 15 years of my career, okay? So that was something that was really important because I have always loved to work with my hands. The Black Totem series. They're not meant to be seen as a group. Each one, there's 17 of them in this series. They are individual works. They are 54 inches tall, 10 inches wide, uh, editions of uh, two. Now the black totems, the totem as a symbol of family history. At the beginning of 1989, I started studying the works of Cuban painter Wilfredo Lam. Um, Afro-Cuban surrealist painter whose work I have known my entire life because my parents collected his work. It seemed, my father knew Lam personally. It seemed natural that at this time that after working for the last two years with Cuban maps at the foundation of my photographic work that I will see Lam's work full of symbols of, from the Cuban culture as a logical continuation of these maps. I look for the iconography and any, any kind of, of um, um, visual language that will talk to me about being Cuban, it was something that I would uh, utilize. Now the conventional negative, the negative that are on the inside of, the, of all the cutting that I utilize, um, it's, it's, a, it's about place, it's about if their landscape, their statues, not necessarily important for the viewer to know where they come from, merely symbols that help me define my position of this world. Um, the repetition of negatives was done purposely. When the viewer looks at the work from far away, all the negative together create a different image that then changes as the viewer comes closer to the work. And that repetition is meant to create a world of movement 
because you see, you move, your eyes move from piece to piece, from fragment to fragment, just trying to understand what is there. Um, from far away, it looks like something completely different than when the viewer comes uh, together. Um, I also gonna show you a few of the other things that I have done. My first public art commission um, is this one, Años Continuos. Um, it technically has been in Miami International Airport for 27 years. I'm getting ready to now start a brand new commission of public art at Miami International Airport uh, this year. Um, I'm in the process of signing the contract right now. That will give me the possibility of doing another public art work. I have done other public art works, but um, this, this by far was the largest um, and it was inaugurated in January of 1996. It's a photos and blasted mural that, that measures two, um, it's about two and, a, two and a half story high, 40 feet by 40 feet uh, tall in glass. Now, whereas photography defined my search for a personal identity in the 1980s and 1990s, by the end of the decade, it challenged me to think about and deal with the present. I found myself addressing issues of decay, mortality, and memory after caring for a dear friend through a long illness. Getting close to the organic became a way of exercising the nightmares that came with watching my friend pass away. At the same time, it became a testament to the memory of our relationship. This is also the large diaso. I created this work using the, um, the paper that architects utilize to create blueprints. Um, I just use and put organic um, material on top of the diazo paper and then just develop it with ammonia vapors and it gave me this beautiful uh, blue very much related to Anna Atkins who is the first women photographer in the world who did the botanical prints um, in 1842. Um, now gardens as romantic abstractions provided insulation from the real world of nature. Uh, the garden has come to be seen as territory between maternal home and threatening world. And it's something, you know, I grew up surrounded by water in the Caribbean, but I also grew up surrounded by the tropics. And that's something that nature has had an extraordinary influence also on uh, my work. From creating installation like the recreation, this one is called the, rec it's a recreation of a room, the art, art act of perceiving to make viewers confront and doubt the spatial real reality of truth and, um, and real. Um, this is called Rooms of One's Own, a room for Eden. Um, and they, two of the walls in this installation are fake. The only one that is a true wall is the one on the, on the right. The center wall and the left walls are dry wall that were built in front of the original wall. That way I, I was able to get to the back of it. Um, I also put um, curly willow, and let me go to the next one so you can see it. I drill holes, put live curly willow. So the day of the opening, I'm gonna go back to it. In the curly willow, there were plants growing because I put a watering system on the two walls that I could reach the back to it. Um, it really made the viewer, because the smell also, the entire mural was beeswax and that's why you have a little area of yellow in here and other areas where there's yellowing on the image uh, because I beeswaxed the entire mural. So the smell of the beeswax, you feel that you are absolutely in the middle of the woods. And it was beautiful because it, your perception of where you were change. Um, then from there, I also did a series of called duplicity as identity, just opposing what is real and imagined. I took 12 images of from, I found this contact sheet of my dad from the 1970s and um, his color is put in. I didn't know where the, the, this contact sheet was, why somebody took 12 images from starting from number one, which is the, fo the complete front image, all the way to 45, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. It will go around the entire head, uh, photographing different angles. And then the last one is from the top. Because my father is still alive, I was able to ask him, you know, what is this from? And he told me that was this sculpture, Marisol, who 
wanted to make a bronze mask of my face. So I would photograph so she could have, you know, at the time we didn't have the digital technology. So they photographed him in film. So when I came upon that um, contact sheet, I decided to, photo, to photograph myself as a student of mine to photograph me in my studio with my camera on film and recreate the 12, you know, ways that my dad was working. And when I try overlapping one on the other, they fit perfectly. And, you know, I have always heard that I look like my father, but I didn't know how much I look like him until I did this work. And when I did, it was absolutely a revelation for me. Because now when I talk to him and when I he comes like we had dinner the other day and I am with him. Sometimes I'm listening, but other times I'm just looking at the way that I'm going to look when I get to his age. And, you know, it's really interesting how it changes your perception of identity. Now, while the term duplicity implies deceitfulness in speech or conduct, it can be argued that it is the basis of all social interactions. Given the fact that the behavior of most people changes according to those with whom they interact. We are continuously recreating ourselves in moments of almost believable duplicity. When are we really ourselves? Do we really have, and there are nine images on this series that goes from 10% all the way to 100%. And um, I started, you know, where, let's say on this one of my father, 20% that's part of the title of this work, that means that they are 80% of my father with 20% of me. This is the one that is 50%. Right now, my dad and I are equal. We're on equal components. Um, you have him and you have me on equal terms. And then suddenly here you have the 80%. That means that this is 80% of me with 20% my father. Okay, so then um, vestiges, vestigio, a trace of something that is disappearing or no longer exists. On this series, I deviated from photographic processes as we know them, using reproductions from books. I started transforming images into ghostly suggestion by manually sanding and erasing the surfaces. And by this, it was I took sandpaper and started erasing the background, parts of the bodies, the fragmentation, the, the clothing, everything that was part, the room that was in there in some images, the, you know, the frames, the, the pictures, you know, everything was sanded and converted into something that was completely uh, different. What remains of the image are selected traces of its original subjects that resemble unfinished graphite sketches. There are about 15 of this work. I'm only going to show this two uh, right now for uh, time. Um, but it's something that this aspect of tracing, something that has been left behind is something that I'm being very much interested. The same as identity is this idea of something that existed before that was there. Um, and then we have the Brevas and Diversions, which um, since 2016, when I received a Paulo Krasner Fellowship in photography, I've taken the time to think about where I was then and where I am now in my art making. The validation and economic freedom the grant gave me and changed me. Um, and I will forever be grateful to the foundation for where it has taken me and where it took me to finally work in a more sculptural way within my work. It was almost a combination of um, sculpture and photography because the black and white and this piece in particular is 44 inches tall by 84 inches wide. It's a print that I made um, by photographing this, the pages of this file. That's how they started. Um, print three of them, one next to each other. I printed it here in my studio with my, on my printer. It was a digital archi archival pigment print. And once I had that, it was mounted, mounting, mounted on a board so I could then proceeded to drill holes or do things to attach three-dimensional material into. I grew up looking at the work of Jesus Rafael Soto. I grew up looking at the work of Celia Sanchez. I grew up looking at the work of um, Henry Moore. Um, 
Laszlo Moholy Nash, the photographer, Gego, the sculptor, you know, and all of this, I decided for the first, I felt at least that for the first time in my life, I was bringing that work that I grew up with. And here in many ways, this part over here is the cover of a book on Jesus Rafael Soto that I have had since the 1970s. And I took the cover and the back cover and then just took it out and, and put it in there. But there are other elements, things that you could actually turn around and move it wire that comes out, metal that comes out, this disc, plexi disc that I printed on top of it, and it has material that I drill holes and put it in there, that comes out 20 inches out of the work. So it's a three-dimensional work that is a very big work. And at the same time, I took all photographic paper that I use in the dark room, Print it, put it in. I took it out of the box. Technically, I damaged the paper, even though you don't see it happen because, but it, I took it out of the light and I put it inside my printer and I printed a very abstract image that I created. So it has now ink on top of it. And by you, by being exposed to the light, as time goes by, it changes color. So it has a, a very not ephemeral, but it has this process of change happening all the time. Um, and then the work, which I think will be the last three images that I have on my presentation are more recent work. Um, and this new work formed the series called Absence Reveal. Andrea mentioned that I have been given a, a Ulites Arts Michael Richard Award. And it was an extraordinary moment for me to be recognized with such a extraordinary grant, grant uh, for a career. And not only, um, you know, the years that I've been working in my um, career as an artist, but also um, what I have been given to the community as a teacher and the two things that meant the world to me. Um, you know, I have said that my first, my first full, I have two full-time jobs. My first full-time job is being an artist. My second full-time job is being a teacher. And uh, the two things had really um, been connected uh, with each other. Now, um, the new series, the new work for the series Absence Reveal came about two through two different personal events in my life. The sudden loss of my mother in this, on December 28th of 2020, and the chance finding of the original 1920s wallpaper of my home in May of 2021. It is about the process of revealing and uncovering. It is also about bearing the pain, the loss, the absence that is now the pre a present. To the process of collage, allow me to rearrange personal stories using personal materials from my mother's that had, from my mother that she had taken out of Cuba in 1960 that I did not know that she had taken out of Cuba in 1960. I was able to deal with the loss. It's using her personal material. In here, you can see her shirt, one of her shirts. The green material is the wallpaper that I uncover when I was pouring down a wall, connecting two rooms in my home where I live here in the Little Havana, Shenandoah area of Miami. Um, I did not know that behind the plaster I was going to uncover the original wallpaper. So utilizing material that belonged to her and then material that belonged to my home, which is the place that I feel the most safe in this world um, because it's my home. Um, I started, I was able to engage in remembering and also come into terms with the loss of my mother, using this material to re-examine events in my personal history, finding answers, and even sometimes creating new questions in my life. Um, by experimenting with different and unconventional processes, uh, some, sometimes you have, I had collage, which is a process that I love. I have the, mater the fabric material, but I also print it on canvas. Those images that have been printed on canvas when then were then collage onto this work. Um, so using different processes, I was able to create what they are unique works. And um, this in particular, which measures 65 inches tall by 103 inches wide, is exactly the same size of the, of the opening that I did to connect the two 
rooms in my home, even though that one was vertical, I decided to use that size as a, as a horizontal instead of a vertical. But I'm very much work like that. I utilize the things that happen in my life to tell me the way that I should work on my, on my work. Um, now, um, I reflect on the closely related subject of archive and memory. This often results in an examination of, of both the human need for conclusive stories and the question whether anecdotes fictionalize history. These new works are not meant to show the complete picture. They are the result of my own interpretation without being hindered by a historical reality, by examining the ambiguity and, or and origination via retakes and variations. I try to increase the dynamic between the viewer or the public and myself, by objectifying emotions and investigating the duality that developed with Gary Metz's words, when a body of work is intentionally made by a photographer, that work will tell us more about the photographer than about photography. Thank you very much. So Madi, I have so many ideas and so many questions. And you know, we have we have about 20 minutes or something. So I wanted to take advantage of being able to ask you some things. Um, okay. You know, I was I was making some notes as you were talking and I was thinking about this idea that that you create these visual palimpsests, mm -hmm. you know, which are fragmentary, but but you may, you take the fragments and pull them together, mm -hmm. and we look at these holistically, you know, mm -hmm. and it becomes you know this visual history of displacement, mm -hmm. of migration, but also the embodied aspect of your work, you know, is what I have always loved. And the way that you're, you know, through these visual fragmented images that you are charting your own origins mm -hmm. and asking these very basic questions about identity, you know, and who you are. And so, so as you know, you know, I love the series that, you know, when I first met you, you were working on the maps mm -hmm. and, I'm going to read just a little line um, from your piece that you, um, which is Historia Frota, Broken History, mm -hmm. um, that you wrote for me for Remembering Cuba when I was working mm -hmm. on that collection. Mm -hmm. And you say about the maps, you find maps, use maps as a special location or a means to find ourselves. Mm -hmm. I wanted to utilize maps as a way to find my roots. I've spent a great deal of time trying to understand what memories of Cuba are, since I do not have literal ones. Mm -hmm. The memories I have, and this is what you've been talking about, are all created fragments of facts, of memories handed down through family stories, books, maps, and documents. And that series, you know, that took you to Spain to go through those archives and layering the maps the way you did and interweaving your own family stories, the images from your own family um, with those maps raised a lot of questions for me. And the other day when we were talking, um, I shared a story with you and I'd love to talk with you a little bit about this. Um, having gone to Spain very recently, and having the opportunity to meet more family than I, I, I could imagine, you know, in different parts of Spain. And we were talking, I was talking with one of um, my, my elderly cousins. And I said to her, you know, I remember the first time I came to Spain, I felt like I was home. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt like I belonged here. It was so familiar to me. And then the first time that I was able to go to Cuba, having a similar feeling, though no quite not quite the same. But there was this familiarity, you know, and comfort being in Spain. And she said to me, Andrea, she said, you're Spanish. She said, you're Spanish. She said, your generation 
and the maybe the generation that followed you, but your generation and the ones before were socialized and acculturated according to Spanish norms. You know, the relationship of Cuba and Spain was unique, you know, mm -hmm. in fact, very different. And there are historical reasons for this from the relationship of Spain to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, so she said, I don't think that this would necessarily be true for Cubans, you know, growing up today in Cuba, mm -hmm. but your generation is Spanish. And that's why this is so, so familiar for you. So I wondered if we could talk about that a little bit, because, you know, the map series for me originally was just so interesting, particularly in the context of colonialism, you know, and those layerings of identity and those kind of violent clashes, you know, cultural clashes and things like that. But, but as I look at your photographs now and look at those maps, and look at a lot of the other pieces you've done with piecing together these fragments, like the, the totems, for example, and simultaneously reclaiming, you know, part of Cuba's cultural history, which, which you know, we all are connected to um, with your own personal family story, which is embodied by the, the totem itself. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this comment that my my cousin made in terms of your own search? Well, you know, it's, it's I had a, a very similar experience in many ways. Um, it was that like I, you know, I grew up having no visual memory of the island. Uh, my parents left as two 23 year old kids with three daughters of which I'm the youngest. I was three months old. So I have no memory whatsoever. But why is it that I have always felt very Cuban? And why is it also that I have also felt very much Puerto Rican? Because I grew up there, you know, and, and in many ways, um, and that's why I say, you know, that I am a Cuban born, Puerto Rican grown American citizen. And the three cultures have had an impact in my life. But what happened was that I never, because I never returned even to this day, I have never returned. I still have not, ex you know, that aspect of arriving home or arriving to the place where I was born, I have not experienced yet. But I experienced something that felt something like that. Um, I took a, a course after I finished my first year of my grad work in Chicago. Um, Bob Lesher, one of the three faculty members that I wanted to go to to study at the Art Institute for, um, was taking a group of, the, of students from the Art Institute on a study abroad um, trip that was going to Spain and Portugal um, to, to study the architecture of both of those countries for five weeks. When I find out about it, before that, before, and I, I think it was on the spring semester, I thought, oh, what a great way to go abroad to two countries I never been and get credit for it. And I could even get financial aid for the, for the class. So I thought, what a great excuse to go on a trip. Um, so I decided I'm gonna go, you know, and I will never forget. I arrived on May 16th, because it was three days before my birthday, May 16th of 1983. And when I arrived in Madrid, Spain, because that's where we went from Chicago to Madrid, and I came, I arrived in Madrid, I remember thinking, I feel like I have finally come home. And I... And it made me realize that in reality, we are only three generations of Cubans, that the rest are Spaniards. I mean, I saw my, my mom's cousins in Madrid. You know, I went, I went to Oviedo to meet the other side of the family, you know? And, and, you know, it was really, it was something that it made me realize, yeah, I'm, I'm Cuban, because, but, I'm, but it was really my, Great grandparents, no, my my grandparents, my parents, and the three of us 
that are Cuban. My great grandparents was Spanish. So that's when I realized that I that I have this feeling that I finally have come home for the first time in my life. And, and you know, it's, it's something that it made me want to find a way to go back to Spain after I returned, because I, I after that, the class was done, I stayed behind because I wanted to travel in Europe. So I stay on for the rest of the summer traveling in train in Europe. But when I returned to Chicago, I remember thinking, I have to find a way to go back to Spain to do my work. And that's when I decided I'm going to apply for a Fulbright, you know, thinking that it was probably too, you know, like I was down here and the Fulbright was over here, you know, it was going to be very difficult for me to get one. I, I grew up knowing what the Fulbright was and how prestigious it was. Um, but I had nothing to lose and I decided I'm gonna, I went to the booklet at that time we didn't have computers. So today you go online and you find out the different countries, what they have to offer. At that time I asked for a brochure. And when I got to Spain, um, I saw the resources. And one of the things that they, that year they were not technically given grants to arts, but they were going to consider applicants in other fields that were not the ones that they were going to fund. It. So I thought, well, that could be me, you know? So. I decided, let me see what the resources are in Spain. And so I went on there and they mentioned the archives of Indies in Seville and the, uh, and the El, El Archivo de Simancas in Valladolid, El, El de Indias in Sevilla, El La Biblioteca Nacional, having all these maps belonging to Christopher Columbus. And I thought, you know, I mean, I did work with maps and I was utilizing them as a way to find myself. Um, maybe let me see if I can develop a project that would allow me to go to these um, archives and work with them. Because even today, when we use a smartphone, we when we need to find where we are, we go to Apple Maps or Google Maps and we put the location and we find where we need to go and where we are, and we just go over there. We, you look at a map. So I wanted to, to utilize these maps as the kind of source for that will kind of make me focus. And I don't mean that literally, okay? But that it will make me focus as an artist in what was really true that I wanted to do, which was to understand why I feel so Cuban, even though I have never lived in Cuba, only that only the first three months of my life, you know? And no. so, it, and it was, you know, it was a, a defining moment for me now to understand people of, of my, people of my generation would, especially if you're an artist, you would understand that search for a personal identity because I also saw other artists that were a little older than me, okay? That were dealing with that. Ana Mendieta, you know, I never met her personally, but I spoke to her on the phone and she was doing the body of work of the siluetas and all these other things because, and going to Cuba because she wanted to understand what made her who she was. And maybe identity is not at that present in her work, but if you think about it, it had to be, she had a need to go back to Cuba. Um, I had a need to, you know, we, I think we were 13 years different between her and I, um, and I had a need to go back to Cuba, but the occasion never presented itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. and today, you know, that I'm less young than I was before, what you have here is, is a, an exile, because I do think of myself as an exile, not an immigrant, um, you know, you have somebody who I didn't have any choice to come or go, to not come or not or, or come, you know, and, um, you know, I grew up feeling very fragmented mm -hmm. and through my work, especially the search for a personal identity, it was important for us, especially when I was in my 20s. And when when Anna was in her thirties, it was that it, that was important. It's understanding who we are, who we and we who we are as a woman, who we are as 
artists, who we are as our, what I call our uh, geographic identity, as the being Cuban or being Puerto Rican or being American, because at the end, we, this is the country that I have lived the longest in my life. Yeah. I, I travel with an American passport. It's important to me. It yeah. means something to me. Mm -hmm. and 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 but at the same time i go to puerto rico or i you know i come upon a puerto rican and you will see my accent shift mm -hmm. immediately <laughs> and my humor is puerto rican you need mm -hmm. you need you, you know it's it's something that is very much i'm very latina you know it's part of my thing my my business world is in english my personal world in many ways is in spanish yeah and yeah. Well, one of the things I'm thinking about listening to you talk, too, is that on the one hand, maps shift and change and there are political boundaries, you know, mm -hmm. um, that are imposed, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, that again, invokes this history of colonialism. And you we're mm -hmm. witnessing that, you know, today in in. Mm -hmm real mm -hmm. life, you know, with mm -hmm. what's happening in Ukraine, for example. So in one sense, this idea of identities that are inscribed or imposed by others, as opposed to the way we define ourselves mm -hmm. and we locate ourselves. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, said this and written this many times is, you know, this search, you know, to try to understand for so many of us, how do we how do we belong to a place mm -hmm. and identifiably belong to a place because this is what happened to me in Spain and also in Cuba that that people you know kept saying to me how do you have this accent right in Spanish that's a little bit Spanish a little Cuban a little Philadelphia you know but you are identifiably Cuban you know mm -hmm. so this question so it becomes this journey and mm -hmm. it's not about a destination it's not about no. defining the lines of that map you know because they're arbitrary in that way and another question that i had for you had to do with um with your series um duplicity as identity mm -hmm. where you were layering again this kind of visual palimpsest you know um of you know searching for origins you know for seeing the connections with your father. But when I first saw that, that series, the thing that came into my mind immediately was that it becomes a visual meditation on the fluidity of identity, especially in regard to gender, you know, and or sexuality. And so I know this is something we have talked about before, but I wondered if you would share your thoughts on that because that visually is for me the most prominent thing that I see when I look at mm -hmm. that photograph. You know the, that that duplicity as identity of which by the way on that duplicity as identity the name of that series in reality have three parts. The first one is the one of my father's face and me. That's the first one. There are only nine nine uh works. Then it's followed by duplicity as identity, um, John Doe and Richard Rowe. Um, and then the last part is duplicity as identity, enigma. And each part, even though the main aspect is duplicity, okay? When are we really ourselves? You know, when we were talking about who knows us really completely? Is there really anyone who does? Um, you know, we we and like you said, it's not it's not the end reaching a destination or an end. It's the journey of of going. You know, and um, we have I have had the the fluidity of identity has has happened in many different ways for me um from the first one you know when i was born and and we you and i spoke a little bit about this uh the last time you know the first thing that that when somebody's born you hear is it's a boy it's a girl you know 
And that is, we don't know how we're going to end it up. No one knows how we're going to end it up, you know, but what we know is the gender and, and what a lot of people don't realize and, and that even though my work has dealt a lot with geographical identity, as I became an adult and I know what makes me the Latina that I am, okay? Um, I didn't look at Cuba anymore. I ended that chapter of my work um, at some point because now the other gender, the other identity came and it was a gender identity because at the end where, you know, and I was asked once, which where have you fight your greatest battles? And the greatest battle have been in gender, in being a female, um, in e equality and and fe feeling that, you know, it's like we, we are given so many labels and at different times in our, in our lives um, for different reasons, labels that are bad labels and labels that are good labels because some you know i have been told go back to where you come from well <laughs> let's start, let's, last time i checked i'm an american citizen this is my country yeah. i've been detained on immigration you know because my last name was martinez and i was detained for four and a half hours being waiting to be to go into an interview and this was june 27 of 2012 wow. okay I have been by that time 32 years an American citizen, you know, um, and I was detained being asked how I entered this country, when I became an American citizen, when I was answering all the questions, an officer that was standing next to the one that was interviewing me suddenly said, boy, you know your script very well. And I say, my script? Wow. <laughs> Wow. You're asking me a question. I'm answering you the question, you know. And I remember being crying because I, I, I thought about this, and I thought, you know, I, I have been an American citizen. I have lived in this country the longest. I belong here. I am exactly what the best thing that this country has, which is a mix of different people that we love and understand each other. The divisiveness that we have right now is something that we have never experienced before. Um, in, 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 you know, because maybe at one time, you know, they suddenly it was free to to hit somebody or to insult somebody or to tell them go back to where you come from. But that's not the that's not the, the world that I understand um, as being an American. Yeah. And and you know, in many ways, is is you know it changes it, it and it's been sometimes fluid and i like to use that word but sometimes it hasn't been it hasn't flowed yeah. that easy yeah. it has been difficult it has been um denigrating it has been um great because i have been like when my my time in philadelphia i associate when i was like a a a, when I was in school in Philadelphia, I think I, at one time I was the only Latina at the time at the university. And I remember that my classmates were dying to find out where I come from. They were dying to hear my Latin music. They were dying to hear about Spanish literature or uh, Puerto Rican literature or Cuban literature. They were, they were embracing that, the unknown. They were embracing what was different for them. But there are other times that I have confronted that that difference has been denigrating. You know, I have been prejudiced or, or, or against because of my difference. Yeah. And, and, you know, when we have worked, the best is when we realize that we can learn from each other. We can educate mm -hmm. ourselves from from the different cultures and the different what makes us who we are. And anyway, again, yeah. duplicity. When do we really know what yeah. we are really? Um, yeah. I mean, what you're describing is, um, you know, race politics, gender politics in the United States are very different then they are, they function in different ways. And this idea of citizenship, you know, has been a perennial question of who belongs and who doesn't. And, you know, the reality is you capture in your work is that, you know, identity is fluid, you know, mm -hmm. and it is kind of, again, an artificial imposition 
um, that you are put in this box or that box. And that's, that's how these politics work, you know, for us. And they function similarly, but di in differently in different places. And, uh, you know, I think about, um, I was thinking about how you capture the, you know, this idea of impermanence and fluidity in mm -hmm. like the series Vestigios, you know, for example, mm -hmm. where you erase parts. And I was thinking um, as I was looking at the images when you were speaking about Roland Barthes, you know, his idea in Camera Lucida, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, that photography is in some sense bespeaks our need to be made historically significant, you know, mm -hmm. to capture something, but at the same time, you know, what, what really is happening is outside the frame, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how we cling to this, you know, this possibility of trying to capture a moment, you know, mm -hmm. of uh, when in fact we're facing impermanence and, your final series, you know, that you did this beautiful, beautiful series, you know, absent, Absence Revealed after the loss of your mother um, made me think about how our relationship to objects and to things, you know, in, the, in this case, you talked about, you know, that suddenly you were finding all these objects, you know, that your mother had brought from Cuba that you had never seen before, or the, the act of peeling back, literally peeling back the layers of the wallpaper on the room, um, you know, bespeaks again, this idea of like objects that somehow connect us to the mm -hmm. past, to memory, to a place that, you know, that we, we only know vicariously in, in the case of your experience with Cuba and mine. Mm -hmm. um, your work is amazing, Maria. I, you know, mm -hmm. I have been such a big fan of your work for so many years and um, having this opportunity to talk with you has been incredible. And, um, you know, we, I want to give everyone the opportunity to, to ask you some questions. So Irai, that we'll be putting a link in, in the chat. And if everybody would be willing to kind of jump over to that other virtual space. Um, we'll give the audience a chance to, to ask questions. But thank you so much for this no, time thank together. You. It's thank you. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you.